Good morning, everyone. Wishing you all happy Independence Day from Piramal Swasta team. Uh, today is our session on individual rights versus collective responsibilities around the pandemic. The session will be moderated by Dr. Pavitra Mohan, who is the Secretary of Basic Health Services. Dr. Mohan is a community health physician, pediatrician, and public health practitioner. He is a co-founder of Basic Healthcare Services that provides high-quality, low-cost primary healthcare services in rural Rajasthan. Dr. Mohan also serves as Director of Health Services, Ajivika Bureau, working to improve health of the families dependent on labor and migration. He was also a senior health specialist at UNICEF India Country Office. Dr. Mohan is an MBBS and an MD from Delhi University and a Master's in Public Health from University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Welcome, Dr. Mohan. We have three esteemed speakers for the panel. Dr. Anand Ban, Dr. Gagandeep Kaur, and Dr. Purnima Menon. Uh, Dr. Anand Ban is a physician with a master's degree in bioethics from the University of Toronto. He is a research uh, researcher with Global Health, Bioethics, and Health Policy. He is also an adjunct professor in Mangalore, India, and adjunct faculty at Kasturba Medical College, Manipal. His work is focused on ethics and equity in health, mental health, digital health, public health ethics, research ethics, community engagement, ethics of innovative technologies, and ethics training for professionals. Dr. Gagandeep Kang is a professor at Christian Medical College at Veldor. It's, it's heartening to know that she's the first woman from India to be elected a fellow of the Royal Society. She's also the first Indian woman to be elected to fellowship of the American Academy of Microbiology and the only physician scientist to receive the Infosys Award in Life Sciences. She works on enteric infections in children, particularly on transmission and immune responses in order to design effective interventions. Dr. Kang received her training in medicine and microbiology at the Christian Medical College, Vellore, where she is also the professor now. Dr. Purnima Menon, a senior research fellow from International Food Policy Research Institute, very well known to all of us as IFPRI. Dr. Purnima Menon is a senior research fellow there on working on poverty, health, and nutrition division, and is based at the in Asia office in New Delhi. She conducts applied nutrition research in South Asia region with a focus on programs and policies to improve maternal and child nutrition. At present, she is leading the team that is conducting impact and process evaluations of Alive and Thrive, BMGF supported initiative to improve infant and young child feeding and child nutrition in multiple countries like Bangladesh, Vietnam, and Ethiopia. Dr. Menon holds a PhD in international nutrition from Cornell University, USA, and a Master of Science in Nutrition from the University of Delhi. With that, I hand over the stage to the speakers and the moderator. Um, Looking forward to a wonderful session. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Rachita. Uh, and I'm uh, glad to be here, not only because it's an important forum, but also it happens to be on an important day. Uh, so happy Independence Day to everyone in the panel and in the audience. Um, you know, uh, I think while it's a day to celebrate, uh, it's also a day to reflect uh, on our constitutional values, uh, rights, and responsibilities. Uh, and as we reflect back, we realize that there are four you know, key values that our constitution promotes, that of liberty, equality, justice, and fraternity. But merely having them in the constitution do not guarantee it. Uh, one has to continuously examine, review, uh, and work towards their promotion. And also, uh, especially at the crossroads, uh, when you're faced with emergencies or with adverse situations, uh, how do these values play out uh, in, in a day-to-day -day life and in the life of a nation? Uh, coming to healthcare, health has been proposed and promoted as a human right um, by World Health Organization and by countries everywhere else. Uh, health is not one of the rights in Indian constitution. However, the right to life is, which subsumes in some ways the right to health. When faced with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we saw that how uh, the pandemic disrupted health systems, livelihoods, and economy. It also led to wide-scale devastation of the magnitude that we had never witnessed. We saw the scenes of people walking foot, beaten and broken, and of those struggling for oxygen, and they are still fresh in our memories. 
there were two tools and there are two tools that we have uh, and we had uh, one is of course the individual and social behaviors and the second uh, equally important are strong and empathetic health systems uh, these are the two tools that we have and we had to face such an epidemic during last one year we witnessed that how often both the tools failed however in between we also saw heartwarming examples of either of the two tools succeeding as we are recovering from a massive second wave of the pandemic and prepare for any subsequent upsurges and and we reflect on what lies ahead uh, it's a good time to uh, look at the state of right to healthcare as well as the responsibilities we as the citizens have to prevent and manage such health emergencies and to really critically and dispassionately view the roles of governments in ensuring right to healthcare and of citizens to assume collective responsibility uh, for facing adversities uh, and emergencies like what we saw so you know taking this ahead uh, uh, anant i would like to start with you uh, and to ask you that you know there, there is this general uh, kind of a question that do really societies that value individual rights uh, over collective responsibility uh, do they really fare worse or better off in terms of access to healthcare especially in managing health emergencies and what is the what is the message coming from how different countries manage were the societies where they valued individual rights much more or where uh, the collective responsibility was uh, uh, disproportionately emphasized on which kind of did better who do you think uh, are more responsible for the devastation that end its individual behaviors and collective society or it's the uh, failure to manage health emergencies Uh, I can't hear you, Anand. Dr. Ban, we cannot hear you. If you can, uh, yeah, the audio possibly is playing around. Um, okay, uh, maybe while uh, Anand is trying to get his uh, speaker on, uh, maybe we move on and we, I uh, move on to uh, Punima and uh, Punima. We, you know, last year we really saw uh, those horrific pictures of people returning on feet and the lockdown, and we also saw that how uh, lockdown and subsequent decline in uh, uh, in in economy per se led to. really shortage of access to food and uh, worsening malnutrition levels access to healthcare decreased do you think is it the, is that an inevitable price that uh, as a society people had to pay for ensuring that we were prevented from the transmission of the pandemic or uh, uh, how how do we weigh these two uh, uh, you know scenarios where one where individual right to livelihoods and right to move around uh, is restricted rapidly uh, and on the other hand transmission of a pandemic Uh, what would be your uh, initial thoughts? Yeah. Um, thanks, Pavitra. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, we can. Okay, great. Um, you know, I, I I think it's hard for those of us who work on issues such as food security and and nutrition to kind of forget the sites that one saw um, around the time of the the lockdowns last year. Um, and i think those are sites that of course the the entire nation and indeed the entire world had a chance to kind of hone in on as a, as you know really an extreme uh sort of impact of the lockdowns that had to be put in place uh, at that point in time and i say had to be put on place because at some level i believe that the public health community and the public health policy community was working with frighteningly little information on the transmission of the the virus and you know there was this i guess a global recognition that something fairly dramatic had to be done to you know put the brakes on circuit breakers and words like that um however i think the social and economic consequences of that kind of a lockdown um should have been apparent and or or you know if there had been enough conversations with people who work on issues of livelihoods especially for the poorest um i think it would have been apparent that you know some kinds of protections would need to be put in place so i think 
you know, practically every nation in the world, and we had examples from China just, you know, before that, uh, sort of earlier in the year, um, you know, we have colleagues who, who sit and work in China, uh, and lockdowns were done, done there without disrupting things like food, food chains and the availability of, of food safety nets, et cetera, for, for people. Um, the, uh, the lockdowns absolutely exacerbated uh, economic inequities, you know, for many of us, uh, you know, who work with data and who write and do other such things for a living in a way, remo removing commuting times, you know, being able to work in the privilege of, you know, of comfortable homes on the things that we continue to work on, you know, was a very different scenario from what the poor had to face. Um, for me, one of the other big challenges, or in fact, I'm going to say one of the biggest challenges here is that while we were tracking sort of in a very diligent day-to-day, end-of-day way, you were getting numbers on cases and on deaths, and you were getting them by, you know, by state and eventually by district and things like that, the, the work on livelihoods never invested in that kind of data. You know, there was just conversation to say, oh, this is about lives and livelihoods, and eventually we'll protect livelihoods. Um, I'm still waiting. You know, where is that same level of, of data collected consistently and frequently that tells us how the poor have been affected? You know, what we have at the end of 18 months today is a lot of data collected by you know, well-meaning academics, well-meaning NGOs, people sort of doing whatever they possibly could in the context of this pandemic to try to understand what had happened to those individual lives as a result of sort of this collective policy, uh, you know, set of decisions that had to be taken, you know, in the face of in that, in, in those days, inadequate information, I guess. Um, the U.S. Census Bureau, for example, launched uh, something called the Household Pulse Survey, where they simply asked a very basic set of questions on household food security and job losses, um, I think almost every couple of months. And that data has been available in public domain for researchers to work on. It's been collected across every single state in the United States. Um, but it And it came from you know, the recognition that it was important to understand what was happening to people at an individual level, so that social protection uh, services, etc., could be deployed appropriately. This should not have been difficult. This kind of stuff should not have been difficult to do if we were going to accept fully that, you know, in taking some decisions that were needed for the collective uh, good at some level and also for the individual good because the pandemic has had tremendous financial burdens for people across the board. You know, I, I have lost count of, you know, hearing about the lakhs and lakhs of rupees that even people who got sick um, have had to spend. But we just haven't recognized that the livelihood side is also, you know, it's a big deal and that we should be tracking very carefully what happens even today because the, the impacts are continuing to follow through. So, uh, you know, I'm also bothered by the fact that, you know, HMIS uh, data were, you know, were simply not available after about, uh, I think, June 2020. It's only very recently that the government's own health management information systems data came back online to actually allow us now to start to see what happened to other health services. What, you know, what happened? 27 million women give birth to babies every year in this country. How many of them were missed by essential services? So there's a whole range of things that relates to people's lives that has been affected by the pandemic and the associated sort of collective policy measures or collective oriented policy measures that had to be made. Um, and I you know, remain concerned that we are not investing in understanding even what what that has unfolded to be and without understanding it you're deploying a set of social protection measures you know there's been a lot of okay let's put additional food into this program let's start delivering you know these programs uh through home delivery etc cetera, etc cetera. but without knowing sort of how badly have people been affected and are these measures going to be enough so i'm still waiting and i am still calling for the kinds of US Census Bureau pulse surveys that were done to be done routinely here. So we really understand what has happened to those individual lives. So let me stop there. Uh, I'm, I'm sure Dr. Pan and Dr. Kang will also have some things to say about, about these things. So I really look forward to hearing about that. Uh, thanks for that, Purnima. I think what you 
said was why while some of it was inevitable to begin with but subsequently to have a better sense of how uh, other parameters are affecting whether it's access to food and livelihoods are affecting the and especially the poorest uh, and the measures to be designed uh, based on that understanding which still, still seems to be lacking yeah. so i think your focus on 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 what is that collective that we are talking of and and to focus on the poorest whom we uh, probably do not uh, imagine in the collective uh, often um so uh, anand are you are you back uh, are you able to no i don't think we can still hear you uh, still need to probably fix that up so while uh, that's being fixed uh so you know moving on from 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 the last year uh, one of the greatest developments uh, over last one year one of probably unimaginable and unprecedented development was uh, and some of the you know some of us were really not sure whether there would be a vaccine at the end of the year but a, a really rapid development of a vaccine and not a vaccine but several vaccines were there uh, however uh, you know the the access to vaccines remains highly highly inequitable uh, even now and inadequate uh, especially for a country of the size of india uh, so coming to you uh, dr kang uh, you know you kind of uh, you've been uh, looking at the vaccine development very closely you've been associated Hello. with some of those projects what would you think uh, you know yeah, what i'm doing is i'm now removing uh, my do that how do you why does the vaccine coverage uh, remains inadequate and inequitable and who is really responsible for that uh, understanding that would help us to then frame uh, you know what needs to be done subsequently Uh, so so what do you think uh, is the re is responsible for inadequate and inequitable vaccination is it people is it market is it government um as with most things in public health the the simple and short answer is it's complicated <laughs> uh the longer answer of course is that if we look back to where we were last year some things were very different one was that even from who and from the country the discussion was around vaccinating a small fraction of the population so who's priority list went up to 20% the indian government was saying that it was going to vaccinate everyone over 50 years of age now 50 was very different from what other governments were classifying as elderly individuals and when vaccines became available it seemed like we didn't even stick to that 50 we were told we were going to have everybody immunized by july that the government was intending to immunize and at that time there was a lot of discussion around why only so many and how do you think it can be done by july when the program actually started in january we started like the rest of the world with healthcare workers then rolled it out to frontline workers and then 6 weeks after starting the program we were already at 60 and above and you know, essentially 10 weeks after starting the program we were at 45 and above not with standing the fact that we are the second largest population in the world and coverage in the groups that had been identified as priority groups was actually pretty low and continues in fact to be low so we did all the right things but we did them on a very accelerated time scale and we did them in the absence of a supply so who do you now say got it wrong if we look at the projections that the vaccine companies made the vaccine companies were projecting a very rosy picture particularly uh, serum and bharat telling us that they were going to have serum was saying we'll have 100 million doses a month by the end of december whereas actually we wound up with serum not reaching 100 million doses a month until july and when we heard from uh, bharat bharat had started off saying we are a 100 million a year vaccine 
and that meant that they would be doing a few million doses every month and that's actually what we've seen they've been able to do 5 10 million a month and only now with adding multiple facilities have they been able to ramp up production but i think one of the things that we could have looked at is one we did not start immunization with anything like the stockpile that we should have had and then when we started to roll out the programs instead of doing a reality check and saying you know let's examine how we are doing over the first 6 weeks and then move forward we just went willy nilly into let's expand 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 and we are the largest program in the world now in principle if there had been enough supply there would not have been anything wrong with that but in practice there was plenty wrong with that and then you add to the confusion by saying okay now states go buy what you want and you have to pay for it which creates this completely unprecedented situation that no country in the world has seen fortunately that did not last very long so it was announced at the end of april it was implemented from the 1st of may and was rolled back by the 21st of june thankfully so now we are back in a situation where the government is procuring vaccines still this really rather odd situation where you're holding vaccine for the private sector when the private sector doesn't want it because with the pricing mechanism that you've set up the caps on pricing the private sector isn't it really interested in rolling out more vaccine because their margin is, has been sliced to the bone so i think where we are is private sector is getting too much public sector continues to struggle and uh, in terms of protocols um, there's very little we can do now to roll it back but states have begun some states to step up better than others we just have to keep pushing we have no other choice okay no thanks for that uh, you know uh, for, for that description uh, you know i think you've talked of the market uh, you know uh, not having uh, i mean actually kind of predicting uh, they're uh, estimating the predi the, the predicted uh, uh, productions uh, much higher than what they were able to do, and some of the policy was probably based on that, and therefore there was a there, there was some uh, problem and confusion there. You also talked of the public systems actually going ahead uh, with expanding the age groups, etc., without really stockpiling. Uh, there is a third component of it, uh, uh, Dr. Kang, that which is people. That there is a lot of discussion in the media. Uh, about the vaccine hesitancy that people are not willing. And that's one of the reasons for slow uptake uh, of uh, vaccines in many places. So what would you uh, say about that? Um, I would divide lack of information of vaccines from vaccine hesitancy. And I think a lot of issues that relate to coverage relate to the fact that people cannot get to vaccines and do not know about vaccines. So those are questions more of access to vaccines, access to information about vaccines, and then this separate set of people who have been fed disinformation, are continually fed disinformation and have bought into the fact that vaccines are somehow dangerous and we need to protect ourselves and those we care about from vaccines. That's a whole different and a much smaller slice of the population. But the problem is when we are looking at a situation where we need very high coverage of vaccines, we are going to need to address those disinformation problems because if we don't address them and try to can, you know, discuss with people what their concerns are and try to alleviate some of their concerns. I, I'm not in favor of forcing anybody to get vaccinated if they really don't want to, 
but i think a lot of misunderstanding around vaccines for the majority of the so called vaccine hesitant population is really a lack of a willingness to respect their point of view to engage with them in discussion and lay out the science for them uh i i can't agree with you more uh, dr kang in the areas that we work in which are the deep tribal areas of south rajasthan we see that how um, you know this disinformation can be quelled if one understands and respects their point of view and also makes vaccine available much closer to where they live rather than it being at a primary health center which is 15 or 20 kilometers away and that too when you come to know that the vaccine is available only the previous night or the same day morning uh, so yeah i agree with uh, with that um, Uh, based on uh, what we are seeing at least in rural uh, tribal india uh, anand are you uh, are you back uh, yeah can i see yeah that? yeah we can now finally hear you all right thank you yeah, so uh, shall i repeat the question or uh... uh yeah so i got a sense of the first questions that you had which was more on individual rights and our more libertarian societies or countries perhaps more uh, likely to respond better uh, or other ones uh, which are more stricter or with less liberty is the ones which are probably responding better so you know my sense uh, pavitra is that uh, at the heart of any response is understanding that in public health you do have this kind of fine uh, balance between individual rights and uh, and collective uh, rights right so you might have certain violation of rights happening in your response especially in the acute phase of response you know responding to a crisis situation and that is understandable but when you do that when you for example ask someone to go in for quarantine or for isolation or you take away their right to travel um or you uh, label them in some way and say you know x person has uh, the infection and hence their uh, right to uh, be able to interact with other people is going to be restricted in any way then you also have a moral responsibility to respond to them right and this is something which is not new uh there has been a lot of learning within the field of public health because we've been responding to these kind of crisis situations now for many many years so right from the 2002 sars uh, pandemic i think there's been a whole growth of the need to uh, look at the lexicon we use in public health to go beyond just saying that someone's rights need to be restricted if you are going to restrict anyone's rights then you need to also be recipro- uh, bring in the principle of reciprocity which is to say that if you are going to take away my rights to be able to travel or to leave my home or if you are going to put me in an institutional setup for say isolation purposes then what is it that the state because the state is the one which is going to take away my rights going to give in return to me so will i have for example access to information will i have access to food will i have access to the ways uh, of communication so that i can keep in touch with my family and will i be told how long is this suspension going to be and on what basis it is and is it applied equally for everyone right there are no politicians there are no uh, folks with power who are given preferential treatment because if you do that then of course you will open yourself to a situation where people will say that you are selectively uh, you know uh, applying these principles or you're not being standard in the way you respond so i think that is extremely important a transparent set of principles and a reciprocal uh, set of obligations from society whenever anyone's rights are violated now linked to that also is a requirement for solidarity which is to say that you have to recognize that equity is at the heart of any public health response there are people who are going to be suffering when you take away their right to be able to go out for example learn their livelihood on a daily basis what are you going to do in response you know if you expect them to stay at home during a lockdown period that isn't it our moral responsibility to respond to their requirements of nutrition or support um and uh, did we do that adequately perhaps we did not and that is what i think purnima was talking about as well so i mean as a republic and this is especially important because that we are at, uh, you know we're celebrating the 75th year uh, today of uh, of our independence that justice is at the heart of our republic and justice requires us to be fair and equitable in the way that we respond and of course pandemics are times where you can take away rights of individuals but you should not do that without providing them a response which recognizes that them as human beings and communities and with their needs and ensures that the state is responding to them in that acute period where you are violating their rights so i think that applies in any country so whether you if you're talking about say china which might have done better towards the initial period in terms of their lockdowns 
or you talk about New Zealand, which is a much more libertarian state, and also did pretty well in most of its responses. I think at the heart of it has to be these principles. So uh, le let me just be a bit more provocative, Anand. That uh, you know, people say that countries where, uh, like China, you gave the example of China, that in earlier times and even uh, during the resur resurgence of the virus there. Uh, they were extremely, uh, uh, you know, strict and disciplined and almost draconian and said that everybody needs to be tested and there's no way out. Uh, and that led to a rapid uh, containment of the epidemic. Uh, and say, and people say that the, the problem in India is because, you know, everybody has a right to go and do whatever they can. For example, we saw that uh, the preceding the second wave, there were a lot of social and religious functions where people had at some point the right to participate. Uh, but that did lead to uh, increased transmission in, in many cases. So. Yes, yeah, so in my you... opinion, anything which is mandatory in nature should be our last resort. I am not in the favor of putting in mandatory measures as our first response. If we work with communities um, in trying to make them understand why is it that we are taking certain steps? Why is it that we have a request that everyone use masks? Why is it that we want more and more people to take vaccines? Why is it that we impose steps like lockdowns? That is where public communication at the heart of it is extremely important and responding to any concerns people might have. But if you just impose steps like lockdowns and don't at the same time also respond to real time needs which individuals, families and communities have, then we are going to have the kind of crisis situations that we saw with large scale uh, labor migration. And how were, how were all of those individuals treated? All of us saw the visuals at our borders where people being, were being sprayed with uh, basically bleach or disinfectant is that how we want our citizens to be treated absolutely not i think you know of course public health is important but public health cannot be at the cost of uh, dignity and and dignified public health responses requires us to keep these uh, important values of how we want to uh, you know treat our own fellow citizens in mind or anyone actually who lives in this country so i am very much in the favor of working with communities for our response and uh, keeping any mandatory measures only as our last resort so, uh, so just to uh, kind of sum this, okay, can you give an example of a country where they did not have, um, you know, the 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 acute and a rapid and a complete withholding of right of rights, and still were able to manage the ma manage the epidemic well? Yeah, so I think uh, as I was saying, probably uh, New Zealand did pretty well. Some of the Southeast Asian countries did well in our neighborhood. I think uh, Sri Lanka has done uh, fairly well too. And uh, again, it is linked also. To countries where health systems probably are more resilient, right? I, I don't think you can talk about a public health response in isolation mm -hmm. and uh, forget that wherever health systems perhaps have more capacity to be able to respond, that becomes important. So I think that that's also an important uh, element when we talk about these issues. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, so what you are saying, Anand, that uh, that there is a way out where engaging people, working with the communities uh, uh, would lead to, uh, is probably the only way to address the emergencies, which will also probably promote collective sense of responsibility, but it does require uh, working with people and kind of respecting their uh, points. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just make a quick point. You know, the one concern I have quite honestly is that um, a lot of our pandemic response over the last one and a half years is what I call a danda response which is basically a law and order response. It has been driven by home ministry, it has been driven by collectors, it has been driven by public health experts. And I think that's the change that we need to bring in by bringing in more capacity in our health systems for leadership from public health experts, rather than it being led by folks who don't have the public health organizations. Okay. So you have made a point about the resilient health systems as well uh, earlier. I take that point. Um, Coming back to you, uh, Punima, that, uh, uh, you know, there was this, uh, 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 after the following the initial uh, lockdown, um, and subsequently there has been a decreased uh, access to food, uh, the, there has been a kind of a loss of livelihood that you mentioned. And you did mention something about the US survey and as one of the ways ahead. Um, would you say that we're moving ahead, how do we ensure uh, that there is a uh, there is a greater access and addressing other uh, uh, problems that were created due to the pandemic uh, while uh, also promoting collective responsibility uh, and the state uh, action uh yeah thanks Pavitra. so you know i think so one of the things that's interesting to me in public policy um 
and public policy is so important for what we're talking about here is if you don't recognize, you have to recognize the problem first and recognize it in its sort of in its fullness um, before I, I think, you know, I, and then many different actors in the public space have to align around, okay, what's the set of solutions to that problem? I, I think with COVID, it was very, um, you know, the recognition of the problem was, was very clear and even across anyone who needed to respond to that problem. And therefore, then the set of responses that unfolded, you know, never said COVID itself is not a problem, right? Unfortunately, in the world of food security, in the world of poverty, uh, even, I'm not gonna say nutrition so much because I think, you know, it took us many years, but we finally accepted, you know, at a very large public policy level that India has a fairly dramatic nutrition problem the way we define it. But with food security, hunger and, and poverty and the loss of livelihoods and economic performance you, we are operating in a public space where our problem recognition itself is very, very uneven. You know, different people have different opinions about how people have been affected by the pandemic. And part of that uh, is that if you recognize the problem differently, if you don't see the problems, uh, you know, if you see them from the lens that you may have for solutions, you're not going to deploy a set of solutions that actually tackles that problem. So we are in a situation where, um, you know, you have, um, so, so we have the Consumer Pyramid Household Surveys by CMIE, and for those who've been maybe following the economics and livelihoods work, which, you know, I, I have to do as well for, for my work, uh, there's a lot of debate on who's captured in those surveys, and, you know, are they sort of really capturing the poorest of the poor? And if they're not capturing the poorest of the poor, then what can we say from this one body of data that we have. And so problem recognition to me, we are really lagging on, on recognizing the, the extent, the nature of the problem of food insecurity, lost livelihoods, uh, you know, hunger, like very sort of basic, these are very basic things. I'm not even talking about nutrition. I'm just saying we just today don't even recognize, know and recognize in a uniform way you know, who's hungry, who, who needs help on livelihoods. And without that recognition, uh, it just means that our policy response and our societal response also is going to end up being uneven and, and patchy. And so I'm, you know, I, the, the US Pulse survey I like because they recognize that they needed data, they recognize it would be problematic to integrate it into standard, you know, existing data systems. And so the Census Bureau decides to, you know, to launch something that's experimental, but still bringing in data with agreed upon questions and things like that. Uh, uh, just to interject there, you talked of the societal response, right? And uh, and that's the point that while on one hand we say that, okay, policy needs to be better. And especially in this case uh, of the pandemic that we're talking of and its subsequent outfall. Yeah. How do you promote a societal responsibility and a collective? Uh, yeah, collective you know, and, and you know exactly. Irrespective of the government action. Exactly. So you know, you have to. We have to understand the emotions that drive civil society uh, action. The emotions were very strong around the time. You know, so a basic societal response. You know, in terms of people with more doing things for people with less. You have that comes from an emotional space. It does not come from a data-driven space. You know, and so I, and I think we saw that we saw how society and people with more responded to help people with less in times when you know the media reports were high, when you could see uh, with an emotional, you know, with your heart, you could see how people were being affected. Those people are still being affected. We just don't see that, right? And so it does not. If it, the images, the things that evoke sort of a societal personal response to the distress of another human being that is not a, apparent to us in the same way we saw that with the oxygen crisis in delhi in in our cities right people saw the crisis at a very emotional very personal very visceral response and responded in very powerful personal ways but that's never going to be enough for a society right because some of us will continue, some will continue to volunteer, some will continue to donate, some will continue to, you know, feed the poor. Some, but the, the, there has to be sort of a base response. And that base response is exactly what Anand said about public health. You know, it comes from 
sort of social sector programs that continue to pay attention to what's happening to the poor in a, in a data-driven way, in a thoughtful way, and just keep tailoring our public responses. And if needed, eliciting societal responses as well, you know, but without the surveys or without sort of the images um, coming out of how the poor have been affected, we are not going to see at an individual level, so, you know, those sort of societal responses. So, you know, I don't know what we, we can do about this. I, I, I think it's, it's bad for society and for politics and for public policy to not have information continue to come out at us on how the poor have been affected. They continue to be affected. Every survey that we do will tell us that. The depth is not visible. The, you know, the desperation is not visible. But people, people are still affected. We're just not seeing it as much at a societal level as we probably should. Sure. Uh, Dr. Khan, just uh, coming back to you and on the vaccine question again, that uh, while there have been uh, problems of inadequate and inequitable vaccination in India, it's also a global problem. You know, the global south is really reeling with, in with you know, with Africa and other countries really not having enough vaccine, and there doesn't seem to be any clear direction in the future. So, what do you think needs to happen to promote equitable access to vaccine? Of course, it is right now. It's a question of timing that there isn't enough production, but there is also a question of cost and uh, reach uh, of the vaccine in many places and how. Uh, what, what do you think needs to happen and is the role of the governments and the market and people in there? So there's not much we can do about the markets. It's not a question of there being not enough money to buy the vaccines because the World Bank and the regional development banks have stepped up to say that they will make financing available for countries to buy vaccine. But there isn't vaccine to be bought and there isn't going to be vaccine to be bought for a few months still. We'll get these little dribs of vaccines, you know, uh, 10 million here, 3 million there, a few hundred thousand doses of vaccines going to some countries. And that's pretty much going to continue at least uh, largely for the next three months, uh, probably the next six months. And then next year, we are likely to have a lot of vaccine available. So there will be, uh, it's estimated that we'll be making 14 billion doses of vaccine next year. Not sure that we will actually need 14 billion doses of vaccine next year. What we can do to change things now is only what rich countries can do. And rich countries can not stockpile. They can distribute what they've got as quickly as possible, make sure that they get it to the countries that have the lowest coverage in the world and help to protect those countries. There is a lot of discussion around booster doses and whether elderly people should be given booster doses. Some countries have already started vaccinating their over 60 year olds. I think the data that support a booster dose strategy for the healthy elderly is not yet available. It's possible that there will be some small incremental impact you could get some slightly better protection, but that's slightly better protection with a whole lot of doses that could have made much more of a difference in countries that have not managed to get people to their first dose as yet. It's possible that there will be a need for third doses or boosters for people who are immunocompromised for some reason. But other than that, I see no evidence emerging that anyone that has received two doses of vaccine actually requires a third dose at this time. Yeah, while some countries have probably already started uh, the policy of uh, a third dose or a booster dose uh, for some populations. So. so good. So, so what you're saying is that the solidarity uh, between rich and poor nations and rich nations need to understand that they need to share what they have uh, with other countries, both in terms of the current, uh, because of the current levels of production, as well as ultimately the cost of uh, of the vaccine, which many countries may not be able to afford. Um, I've got a lot of questions here, and I would probably just uh, shoot some of them to uh, uh, 
to you, uh, Anand. Um, I'll begin with Anand. There, there are two questions which are related and are opposite in nature. The first question was related to that, is it a right to attend a social or a religious gathering in face of an epidemic? And the second related was that, what should government do to ensure that human rights are not violated during the... So these are kind of juxtaposed together. <laughs> so it's a difficult one for you, Anand. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Uh, those are, uh, yeah, it is a difficult one. I mean, there are social events and there are social events. What I mean by that is, um, I think what we should not be taking away uh, from individuals, families and communities is things which are very dear to them for any reason. For example, if there is an important festival, I would rather suggest that we hold that festival in a symbolic manner rather than not hold it at all. So, you know, whether that be any kind of an important, uh, meaningful, uh, small event where a few people come in and you conduct whatever rituals are required for that. Similarly, the fact that uh, even when there was now adequate evidence, uh, families were kept away from fu funerals of their family members who died of COVID and they were not allowed for closure. You know, that is, you can call it, call that a kind of a social event because it's an important part of our culture. It's important for families to get some element of closure. But the fact that they were kept away from it, sometimes were not even informed, funerals were already happening, and then later on, perhaps they got access to ashes, etc. I think that could have been avoided, especially when evidence came through. If it would have been, you know, it would have been more humane to allow for certain uh, social events around that to happen. Having said that, you know, when you on the contrary, we start having social events where it's considered okay to go beyond guidelines which are applicable, where people come in and masks are not used, where ventilation is not um, ensured, and where numbers go much beyond what is manageable in that situation. Then, of course, that's where the role of the state comes in to 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 step in and explain why that is not acceptable and this is not the time to do it. Those kind of sacrifices, of course, should be demanded of and expected. Uh, violation of rights, as we talked about earlier also, I think there are times where violation of rights might be acceptable, but only if it is transparently done, where there is no uh, subjectivity and where there is a clarity of the purpose. And that is a very time-restricted measure. And when you are violating anyone's rights, you, of course, give them something in return so that, you know, whatever is their requirement for them to be able to uh, sustain themselves at that point of time it has been well taken care of. It cannot be something which is indefinite in nature. Uh, thanks for that, Anand. And uh, uh, Purnima, to you, uh, it's a related question. And the question is that when rights are not secured, can the system demand of duty and responsibility from the citizens? It's, I, I, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not a constitutional expert or anything, but I, I think, um, you know, the two go hand in hand is probably the safest thing to say. I mean, each of us has rights as individuals, um, but we also, you know, have to sort of really view our tremendous responsibility to to each other. And and I don't think it's it's duties to the state. I mean, the way that I think about citizenship or, you know, just being being part of a society is is that if if you're part of a caring and humane society, you will consider, you know, how other people are affected by the ways in which you want to exercise your rights. I mean, we are seeing, a, you know, quite a remarkable breakdown around some of these things in, in the US right now with, you know, masking behaviors and, uh, you know, where, where does, where, where do sort of my rights end, you know, what is the intersect between my rights and, and your right to live a, live a healthy life, etc. So, I, I think it's not about what's written in paper. This has to be, you know, how we view ourselves as human beings in a, in a social setting above everything else. You know, if we care for our fellow human beings, then what we are asked to do to protect other people should not seem like a, you know, like a duty to some state. It's a duty and it, it's for the people around us. And for the most vulnerable among us, you know, I, I think for me, like, you know, Gandhiji's talisman in a sense for me is, you know, it, it's really very powerful. I think about that a lot, you know, what do I do and how does that affect some of the most vulnerable people in my society? If we're not thinking about that, then, you know, I, I think 
we're sort of not operating in a humane way. So beyond what's written in constitutions, I think there is a place for just mm -hmm. human beings in social settings here, right? In compassionate Thanks societies. Thanks for uh, bringing that, uh, uh, Purnima. I think that's extremely critical. And uh, yeah, I mean, you can write whatever you do, but what you live is really important in yeah, yeah. on a day-to-day -day yeah. basis. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Kang, there's a question for you. It says that, uh, are there any advantages of having a public-private mix in delivery of vaccines? Oh, absolutely. And if we look at the role that organizations outside government play on the ground in terms of supporting people to get access to health care, it's not just about vaccination. It's about all kinds of ways of accessing health. What we need is for the government to facilitate these kinds of interactions because many of these groups are doing what the government itself cannot do. They are filling in the gaps. And you know it better than anyone else, uh, Dr. Mohan, but uh, I think there are plenty of non-governmental organizations that are providing services that go above and beyond what the government does and they are critical now involving them in their vaccination would be one of the best ways of doing things now i know that it is already being done by many such organizations that have sourced donated doses from companies, from private individuals. But if the government could look at the micro level at identifying partners and making sure that these partners assist in improving coverage, especially for those in whom early improvement in coverage is very important, which is the elderly and people with comorbidities who may not necessarily be able to get to the government centers. That's absolutely, we should be doing that. Okay, thanks for that in a way clear you know, response. <laughs> it's not complicated. There needs to be more partnership. Um, so, uh, uh, Rachida, can you just put up the, the scores of the poll on the screen to get done with and see that what people feel about these some of these uh, uh, binary questions <laughs> with complex answers. Yeah. Um, did we uh, do we have the scores here? Um, Dr. Mohan, it's on the screen. Are you unable to see it? Yeah, I can't see the scores. I can, I can see the, the votes. Button. These are the votes we have received. Okay. No, I, I can't see the scores as well. But, uh, so, so we can. I, so if you can, can just maybe, yeah, if you can just speak out, out. Yeah. Okay. So, what comes first in your opinion? Rights or duties? For rights, we have received 11 votes, about 34%. Whereas for duties, we have received 22 votes, which is about 66%. Uh, yeah. Is, is that the only question? Or no, are there, there are more. There are more. I'll just uh, go one by one. So this was the second question we had. Should the fundamental right to freedom hold true in case of public health emergencies such as COVID? Uh, about 56% of the people have voted a yes versus a 44% for a no. And now the votes are changing actually. So 50%, 48% for a yes. Interesting. Then we uh, had a, the next uh, question was, should quarantine be a voluntary or a mandated measure for disease suspects. 12% uh, of the people said it should be voluntary versus uh, 88, now about 89% saying it should be mandatory. Okay, thanks. And uh, uh, I think it does tell of the, uh, of the views people have. And I hope that this uh, session and this discussion would have uh, 
further provided uh, some thoughts and some uh, you know fodder for reflection further on some of these issues which are extremely difficult to uh, put in black and white as uh, purnima was saying rightly that it is what you make out of uh, what is written in the constitution or what is written in the rule book of how uh, how do you uh, uh, you know uh, value uh, others uh, how do you uh, uh, value uh, uh, you know especially the most vulnerable uh, and uh, how how some of these things play out in practice uh, and i i actually at the end of the session i try to sieve out some of the key kind of discussion point that might help us in uh, in these reflections of the discussion on elective response uh, individual rights and collective responsibilities i would not call it individual rights versus collective responsibility i would call it individual uh, rights and collective responsibilities there is no fight between the two and therefore i think this binary uh, uh, discussion is probably not the right way to look at it uh, but it is a good question to pose some of the things that i that that i take away for me from this session when i thought that there needs to be uh, a greater communication between the governments the market and and the civil society and people themselves most importantly how do you have an honest transparent timely communication and that would probably help in both ensuring and promoting responsibility as well as ensuring rights in absence of that there are positions taken which can become stiffer and uh, can lead to confusion and second and the related point is participation whether it was participation uh, in the initial phases to discuss what should be the right policy where should we be going uh how do you ensure that livelihoods are preserved or the food security is ensured uh some of the participation of different players and honest communication between them uh, could uh, you know again ensure uh, uh, ensure both responsibilities and promote rights uh third thing that i took away from it was that uh, the resilient health systems i think they are critical if the systems are resilient and i would go a step further based on our own experiences is that trustworthy health systems while resilient would mean that they are not affected by the pandemic and they continue to provide care trustworthy means that people continue to trust them in normal times and in emergencies and therefore uh, they are both able to ensure the right to access to healthcare as well as promote responsibility because people have trust in them uh, so i think resilient and trustworthy health systems would be uh, another kind of a, a critical uh, yes. fourth i think i uh, the uh, fourth of fifth whatever i'm bad with numbers but uh, uh, but the the next i think an important point was that people did really respond to the situation and there is a societal response and that's something we should not uh, kind of undermine and actually see that how can it also be promoted not only in the times of absolute emergencies or uncomfortable scenes around it or when your own people are affected but also in normal times can data be the solution is promoting a more compassionate society how do we create that but the power of people uh, what we saw during emergencies can that is it something that we can uh, you know promote uh, and foster uh, in normal times as well uh, uh, and that would again uh, be both which is both engaged uh, undertake uh, the responsibilities and also ensure uh, you know that everybody especially the most vulnerable uh, rights are protected and and uh, and uh, finally i think uh, uh, the equity uh, that you know who is collective and is the middle class the collective are the people who are on this panel or people like us are we do we form the collective who really forms the collective consciousness how do the voices of those uh, who is not heard in social media or on media uh, are they the part of the collective that we are talking of are their rights how do we pro promote their rights or protect their rights how do we ensure uh, that they are engaged in their own development and uh, growth and and that, and therefore become more responsible Uh, 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 you know, uh, responsible citizens, so to say. Uh, so, with these, uh, I think these are some of the considerations. So, when faced with how do we create a society? So, I would think at the end that we should not think of this pandemic as and find out only solutions for how what do we do now. But I think we have to dream and envision that what kind of society are we talking of? Is it is a society where there is greater communication, there is greater participation, there are resilient and trustworthy public systems. and where equity and the and the and the face of the uh, of the most marginalized is what what is prioritized uh, whether they are you know uh, underprivileged or elderly or uh, whatever so if that is the society we are dreaming of then i think uh, it would be a society where responsibilities would come naturally and nobody would have to really fight for uh, accessing their absolute basic rights so with these words i would uh, like to thanks all the panelists um uh, really privileged to be with all of you here and thanks to all the audience and of course uh, the organizers and and happy independence day once again
and i think if we can on this independence day we have this vision it will be a great uh, you know a start so thank you everyone thank you thanks a lot what an amazing session uh, you know it feels wonderful to end the self track of charcha 2021 on such a high note thanks to all of you uh, the theme of the health track the forgotten amidst the pandemic was chosen this year to with the hope to bring to the fore the issues which had taken a backstage during the pandemic we do recognize the importance and the urgency to address covid-19 more so because of our work in aspirational districts at national state and district levels where we have been working very closely to minimize the impact of covid uh, on a war footing in fact during this time we realized the disruption of services the routine health services were falling behind so our endeavor has been to table this and hear from the experts So over the last three days, uh, we had the privilege of listening to great speakers with Dr. Reddy's opening address, which provided us an overview of the pressing public health issues today, issues that we cannot neglect anymore. The session on recognizing differences brought together an extremely interesting set of speakers who highlighted the plight of the vulnerable sections of the population, such as tribal communities, people with disabilities, sex workers, among others. uh there are many we could only pick and choose some of those uh, and we brought together the challenges they face in accessing basic health services especially uh, during the pandemic dr pathare's session which was on mental health and mental health care was very enriching his articulation of complex issues in simple words were brilliant as was dr vandana shiva uh, speech which was on a perspective on emerging one health approach and bringing together the most important word in today's time sustainability we also touched upon uh, menstrual health and ncds each panel bringing with it experts from the field and today's session as rightly said by dr mohan that it is not a binary it's not individual rights versus collective responsibilities it is and collective responsibilities which has left us with pertinent issues to consider as these affect lives of each one of us so it very nicely summarized by dr mohan that an increased dialogue between the citizens and the government citizen engagement and a health system that we can trust came out as uh, important ones uh, not to miss on the research component hearing societal voices picking in those and planning around it on behalf of piramal swasthya team i would like to share my gratitude to all the speakers for being with us in this journey together we would like to thank the nach foundation for trusting us in curating the health track and supporting us throughout as always it has been a pleasure to work with you sudha gana and everyone else working behind the scene a big applause to the piramal swasthya team who have worked relentlessly to curate the sessions making it a big success all the recordings of the sessions will be available at piramal swasta facebook page have a great day jai hind